Let's pray. Holy God, as I speak, open all our hearts that we may listen for what your spirit is saying. Amen. How's that? Right, I'll start anyway, and we'll see, we'll see how we go. The future is unknowable. To some people, this might seem like a really obvious statement of fact. And yet, I think we're often quite loath to believe this truth. We resist it. Perhaps we are even afraid of it. Time and again, we lay out the best predictions and plans that we can for our lives and for our world. And we live out of their security. We can even turn this vice into a virtue. We might say that having a plan or an explanation for every situation is just being well organized, efficient, productive, or prepared. But more dangerously, as we confirm and solidify this world of predictions and plans that we have created, we can come to live as if it's real. In doing so, we unwittingly create and recreate our own future. The first time I came to this church, I didn't spend much time thinking about the future, or so I thought. I felt like I was just trundling along. I had finished medical school and was coming to the end of my first year working in a hospital. The assumed, unquestioned plan for my life stretched out in front of me. I was going to complete my foundation training choose a specialty pathway after that, save up to buy my own place. I don't think I was clinging too tightly to these plans, but I never really questioned them. I was a Roman Catholic at that time and had come along to St. James's for the ecumenical Christians at Pride service. During communion, the bread was lifted up and ever so subtly, my world was turned upside down. Sitting in a pew, I thought, that's what I want to do with my life. At that time, this strong feeling that I had didn't make any sense at all. It was the equivalent of hurling a wrecking ball into my life plans. Two weeks later, I made an appointment to see Lucy and waited nervously outside her office with part of me absolutely convinced that I was going mad and that she would think so too. <laughs> but my experience in this place all those years ago was something more than just a disruptor of my life plans. It came with a sense that I was thinking the unthinkable and in acting on it, I was doing what part of me assumed could not be done. I relate to our Acts reading from this perspective. For me, Peter's experience of God caused him to break free from the constraints of the assumed certainties which governed his world. The preconceptions which had become conflated with God's reality. The key issue which is under discussion at the beginning of Acts 11 is whether Gentiles should be included among those early followers of the way. Those referred to as circumcised believers in this passage objected to receiving Gentiles into the church, 
And one reason for this was the traditional restrictions on table fellowship between Jews and Gentiles. This was the framework within which those circumcised believers questioned Peter about his behavior, which was in clear contradiction to their tradition. However, Peter's experience of God had moved him so far away from his tradition that his behavior had become totally unintelligible, incomprehensible to those questioning him, to the point that Peter has to explain his behavior and his reasoning to them step by step. I think that Peter is living out of a new reality, the reality which we might sometimes call Easter, in which the Spirit of God leads us into places we never dreamed of going. I'd like to draw out two features of this new world, which might help us this Eastertide as we seek to live more deeply within it today. Firstly, in this new reality, our central task is not to seek confirmation for the truths that we think we already know, but to listen for what the Spirit is saying. In order to do this, I think that we need to live from a place of radical uncertainty. This is a place within which Easter itself has become strange, a continually unfolding mystery. I think that in our everyday lives, Easter is often revealed to us as it was revealed to Peter, in visions, dreams, and other so-called liminal or boundary spaces. These are places in which the fixed assumptions of our world begin to break down, places where we are drawn to see things differently, places in which we can sometimes feel the boundary between heaven and earth itself blurring. Although this could all sound very lovely, liminal spaces are not necessarily pleasant places to be. Rather, they are places where our wounds matter because they are real. For me, the Christians at Pride Service that I attended here was a liminal space. And I wonder, what have been the liminal moments of your life? What have been the moments that caused you to see things differently? I think we can have these liminal moments, not just as individual people, but as a whole society. Although sometimes, I think reading the news, it's very difficult to see how this can happen. Perhaps the COVID-19 pandemic and the Russia-Ukraine war are two recent and ongoing events which have destabilized us and our assumptions about the security of our lives. But rather than opening us up to the work of the spirit, these massive traumas can so easily cause us to turn in on ourselves once more as we attempt to conserve our seemingly scarce resources. This movement inward can sometimes be so subtle that we don't even realize it's happening. Take the pandemic, for example. As of last month, just over 15% of low-income populations had received one dose of COVID-19 vaccine with the vast majority of the world's vaccines being administered in high and upper middle income countries. A UN committee for the elimination of racial discrimination has recently concluded that this inequality replicates slavery and colonial era racial hierarchies. In this case, and in so many others, these enormous disruptions in our lives seemingly cause us to perpetuate, out of fear, the cruelties of history. All this brings me to a second feature of the new world, the Easter, that Peter is advocating. This is a world that, in the words of our Acts reading, makes no distinction between them and us. The Spirit of God falls on Jew and Gentile alike, 
the same spirit that descended on the day of Pentecost, the same spirit that Jesus had promised. As Peter explains to his questioners, withholding baptism from the Gentiles was tantamount to hindering God. And as we've already seen, this hindering of the Spirit's work is all too easy to do. We might seriously desire to work with God, to enter into God's reality, to play our part in bringing about God's kingdom. But I think there is only one thing that makes all of this possible. And we're reminded of it by the words of Jesus in our gospel reading. Love one another as I have loved you. In order to enter into the new world which is all around us, the new world which God is bringing into being even as we speak, the new world which is bursting in with all its holy chaos into our self-made fantasies. In order to enter into this world, we must open ourselves up to receive the love which God offers us. Let me return to my own story for a moment. At the Christians at Pride service in this church all those years ago, Lying behind this experience is another moment which is really important for me. And it came at a time when I was attending the LGBT young adults group at Farm Street Church in Mayfair, which some of you may know. It came at a time when I was really struggling with my sexuality. I went on a day retreat there, which had the theme made in God's image. And at some point in the afternoon, two of the organizers set up a room for reflection into which they played a couple of songs that had really helped them. I sat in that room, hunched over, lost in my own thoughts, and listened somewhat absently to the music playing. And these lyrics really captivated me. You see the real me hiding in my skin, broken from within. Unveil me completely. I'm loosening my grasp. There's no need to mask my frailty. Because you see the real me. Wonderful, beautiful is what you see when you look at me. You're turning the tattered fabric of my life into a perfect tapestry. And you love me just as I am. For me, this is the most essential work of justice. We must allow ourselves to be loved by God outrageously, just as we are if we are to love others in the same way, if we are to truly make no distinction between them and us. Love is our final gateway into the mysteries of Easter. Love is the gentle offering which the liminal spaces in our life help us to feel. Love is the force that draws us into God's reality, the force that transforms how we relate to others and our earth. In Jesus' words, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. May the knowledge of God's deep love for us give us the courage to be led by the Spirit into everlasting life this Easter and always. Amen. <laughs>